So welcome to this talk, everyone, and thanks for sticking with me. My name is Hanno. I'm from the Netherlands, and I had a great walk around the old city center. You have a beautiful city right here. I really liked it, especially the old uh, market square. Uh, beautiful. Uh, so thanks for having me. And uh, the reason that I'm down here is because uh, I'm a Dvorak typist. Well, I used to be normal, like you guys. <laughs> yeah, I used to be a QWERTY typist, you know. Um, but uh, there was, a, like a year ago, I had a year in which I would wanted to learn something cool. And I thought, why, why don't I just learn a new keyboard layout? Well, this wasn't really the only reason. Um, also, I tend to suffer a lot from RSI, you know, repetitive strain injury. Uh, I also had a similar complaints when using the mouse, so I uh, taught myself to use my left hand on the mouse so I can switch a bit. I also use a bamboo template so that I can control my mouse uh, using a, a tablet. And I also uh, started uh, avoiding the mouse uh, completely by uh, just learning all the uh, IntelliJ shortcuts by heart, which is uh, a great thing to, to learn uh, apart from keyboard layouts, by the way. Um, now, before switching to a different layout, uh, I really wanted to make an informed decision, not just switching because it was cool or because it was extra geeky and it would get me into conferences. Uh, so um, I really did some thorough research on QWERTY and why it even uh, exists in the form that it exists right now. Um, so this talk also contains some findings uh, regarding this research. And also um, I'll share my experience learning a different layout and uh, what, what will be the challenges that you're up against. So that if you're ever considering it, um, please listen to the talk first and then see if you're still willing to consider it. Or it, it could also be that you, your conclusion will be uh, Hanno tried it and it took a very long time and he's not even as fast as he used to be at, on QWERTY. So should I even consider it? Now, um, it's important to know that I have been touch typing QWERTY since I was 13 years old because I took a course uh, in middle school. Um, and uh, you know, uh, there was an instructor and everything and they played a tape that uh, called out the letters that you had to type. Maybe you, you guys have this in Poland uh, as well, I'm not sure. Uh, I was using WordPerfect 5.1 <laughs> in order to learn it, so it was qu quite some time ago. Um, and I want to make clear from the beginning that I didn't switch for speed reasons uh, because I learned to touch type um, quite early, and um, I could type around 80 words per minute uh, last year, so it's quite fast enough. Uh, th that wasn't the main reason. I'll get to that later. Let's get started a bit on the origin of QWERTY. So the year is 1868, and typewriters in 1868 looked like this. It's an electric printing telegraph, and uh, it's equipped with a piano-like keyboard. So there are white keys and there are black keys. Um, the white keys contain the letters A until N, in alphabetical order, that is, and uh, the black keys contain the letters O until Z. Uh, actually quite organized. Uh, and uh, whatever was inputted on this piano would be transmitted to the printing telegraph, which sits on top of the piano keyboard. So this is a bit closer look at the piano like keys and you can see the alphabetical order and the reverse of the alphabetical order in which um, the keys are organized. Actually, I, I made a mistake a few minutes ago. So the black keys actually contain A until uh, N and O until Z is on, are on the white keys. Sorry about that. Um, now, 10 years later, a keyboard look like, looks like this. Now the middle row looks still kind of logical, I guess. You know, from A, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, M, still a bit alphabetical. But what in the world happened to the top row and the bottom row? What happened there? I mean, it's like, it's like they thought, let's, let's come up with a new keyboard layout. Let's ask a group of monkeys to throw some keys against the wall, uh, smear the, the wall in, uh, with paint, uh, with, uh, with glue, you know, and uh, let's see where these letters stick. It's like completely randomized. So there must be a story behind this. Um, why was this changed? Um, an old keyboard nerd joke 
goes like this. If alien archaeologists landed on Earth a million years from now and tried to figure out what we looked like based on our keyboards, they would probably figure that we had 10 tentacles coming out of our chests, uh, which is uh, one of the, the jokes that's on the, the website of Keyboard.io, which is a product that allows you to configure your own keyboard. I don't use any uh, uh, product like this, but uh, you, you can they are available and you can use them if you want. Just uh, um, use a very different layout. Um, now, I'm, ve I'm very curious wh uh, what you think and what you guys are using. Um, so let's ask you guys, um, how do you feel about this and about the keyboard layouts, actually? Here we go. Let's see, this is not the right one. So I've lost my presentation right now. It's just, just, just great. I'm looking for this one. So, so if you could get your wireless devices out, if you want to join the poll, uh, you can go to menti.com and uh, answer the question that's on there. I'll try to join it myself. Just to have a quick poll on what layout you're using right now. Oh, I, need, I need to open voting, well, just a moment. There we go. So you, you, are, you are asked to enter a pin code, which is at the top, 752141. So most of the times when I cast my vote, it is immediately clear on the screen that I voted, right? Here it goes. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah. That uber geek that's using Tvorak, the only one. <laughs> okay, I think we got a clear view here. 96% uh, is using QWERTY. So did I uh, tell you already that this keyboard layout is very widespread? Well, as you can see, it really is. Uh, I think one person voted for Dvorak and one voted for Colmac. <laughs> so good for you, actually. One more question. This is about the myths that we'll, we'll be, uh, uh, we will be um, talking about. I need to open this one again. Next time I'll open it before. There we go. So. Why do you think the QWERTY layout is ar arranged in this particular order? And just, just choose the one that you think is true or the one that you heard the most, um, because uh, there are all kinds of explanations. Actually, these four answer options I will discuss uh, all in a short period of time. Um, so. Again, the most widespread explanation here is that it was to prevent jams in early typewriters. Um, but I'll consider the other explanations also. Ah, oh, what's this? Ah, there we go. Just clicked on a, li a link. So, created to slow typists down. Just a moment, let me synchronize this for a moment. Created to slow typists down. This is a, a lot, uh, this explanation has been uh, heard a lot. Um, but I think it's questionable. Uh, and there's also some research that supports this. I will have the link uh, at the bottom of, uh, of, the, of the screen in a moment. There actually were no fast typists in the 19th century because the first touch typist was Mr. McGurin, Frank Edward McGurin, and he, he started to develop his own touch typing methods in 1881. So this was 10 years later, uh, 10 years after uh, uh, the QWERTY layout was, uh, was thought of. So uh, people were not... Uh, using their muscle memory to type. They would just look at the keys um, like that. Uh, Mr. McGurn could type 97 words per minute, which is quite fast. So on QWERTY, I, I, I couldn't even reach that. 
because I said I, I, I'm, I'm doing 80 or something. Uh, on modern keyboards, that is. So this is quite an achievement from this, uh, this sir. Um, maybe it was created to slow telegraph operators down while also this is very unlikely because more senders were actually quite fast and almost constantly waiting for a new input. Um, in fact, at a typewriter demonstration in 1872, the Morse receiver almost begged the operator to please type a bit faster because the customer was not impressed at all with the speed. So you can read up on this in the paper that I uh, linked at the bottom. Um, I don't think this is the ex explanation. So maybe it was created to prevent jams in early typewriters. Well, this is uh, an explanation that we have all heard quite often uh, because these mechanical hammers uh, were situated very close to each other and if they were struck in rapid succession, they would sometimes jam and um, uh, no progress whatsoever. Um, now, this is uh, an image of uh, a typical letter reel um, and notice that a lot of letters uh, are situated opposite each other. So, for example, the letter T is up here, and the letter H is down here. Um, as far away from each other as possible. Now, as we all know, TH is a very common combination in the English language. So, probably this is why they put it opposite each other. Now, in the, in the following research paper, they uh, summarized all the uh, common combinations that uh, have been found in the English language. And there's a very peculiar uh, uh, number here. Because, as we saw, T and H is up here, and it's situated 180 degrees from each other, so opposite each other. Uh, but the second most common combination is E and R, and they are actually next to each other in the QWERTY layout. So, uh, by that logic, if they really wanted to place all the common letter combinations as far away from each other as possible, I would assume that this would be an ordered list from uh, top to bottom, so 180 right here, and you know that, that there would be, would be some correlation, the highest number here and the lowest number down here. I don't really see this correlation. So um, I'm not saying this myth is debunked, but I have some questions about it. And in these, this research paper that I linked, there are also some questions. Um, furthermore, this is uh, a picture of a typewriter in 1873. And as you can see in this picture, it's a bit small, um, there's the Q, W, E, and um, a punctuation mark, period, right there. There's no R. The R is actually at the bottom, right here, where the, where the, where the period is right now. And um, so the E and R used to be quite far, quite far from each other, um, but it was switched by uh, the company who sold these typewriters because apparently customers had told the typewriter company, that it would be very mu easy to have the R next to the E. So this is a bit strange in this explanation. So I'll not say this myth is debunked. I think it's plausible, maybe questionable. Um, not the most likely story anyway. Uh, so let's get to this one. It was created so that the word and the brand name typewriter could be typed by using the top row only. Um, well, this is a very cute story. Uh, and it's actually true if you look at your keyboard. The word typewriter can be typed by using the top row only. Um, actually, this idea was suggested by Mr. Paul David Allen, that it was used to impress customers, that salesmen could, could, could come to the door and uh, present uh, the potential customer with the keyboard layout and then rapidly packing out the brand name typewriter so that they would be convinced to buy it. Um, well, actually, the brand name wasn't actually typewriter. It was called Scholes and Glidden typewriter after the two inventors of the layout. And the R key, yes, that one moved to the top row, but the hyphen key didn't, and the word Scholes or Glidden can't even be typed using the top row only. They require multiple rows. Um, and also, sales demonstration were, were not done at the doorstep of these potential customers. They were done in special, specially prepared demonstration rooms by sending and receiving more telegraph. So, I don't think this one is very plausible. So, the fourth option, did telegraph operators create QWERTY according to their own preferences? Well, I think this one is the most plausible, um, but let's not have a debate on it. Um, I can show you why I think this is, a, this is uh, the case. Um, so actually, the first installment of this key, just a moment, it's not working. Kay. The first installment of this keyboard 
There we go. Actually, it looked like this. This is the, the image that I, told, uh, that I uh, showed you earlier. Now, um, like a year and a half later, the first customer was Mr. Porter. Mr. Porter said, can I have three rows instead of two? Oh, sorry. Can I have three rows instead of two? And can it be more, a bit more differently? So then it looked like this. There were three rows, numerals were added, punctuation marks were also added, added and there's still a bit more alphabetical look and feel to it. Um, and the next iteration, it's like an iterative software development process, right? was like this, and um, the Q and W moved to the upper row, and this is the layout that we saw earlier with, uh, with a period in the top row. And actually, um, there are quite a few interesting things here. For example, the S is situated between the Z and the E in this, uh, in this scenario, and this is because um, there was no separate Morse signal for the letter Z. They just pressed an S and an E in succession, and this would mean the letter Z. So uh, it, it could be... Uh, it happened a lot of times that uh, an S or a Z was actually interpreted as a, as a successive S and E after each other, or the other way around. So the telegraph operators asked, can we please have the S very near to the Z and E, because we need to be able to make some changes, correct our mistakes. So this is why they changed that one. And finally, in the final iteration, the I was placed between the 8 and the 9. And this is because they wanted to be able to type in years um, more efficiently. Because, as you can see, there isn't even a one numeral, or a zero for that matter. Um, they used the I and the O letters for that. And um, this is why the I is between the eight and the nine, so they, they could type years like 1800 and 1900 more quickly. It's a very old-fashioned requirement, guys, and we're still using this one. Now, finally, the final change was the Y was moved to the top, of the, to the top row by Scholz, the inventor himself. And in April 1874, the QWERTY layout was finished. And um, whether, well, actually, I think it's safe to conclude that whether this was due to um, the jamming problem or uh, the requirements by the telegraph operators, uh, we can conclude still that this layout emerged out of a few very ancient requirements that don't apply today. We don't have a jamming problem because of digital keyboards, and there the profession of telegraph operator doesn't even exist anymore. So I think it's safe to say that we're all using very old-fashioned keyboard layout. So should you switch to the Vorac? Well, not everyone should, sh should switch, and the only reason I did was because I needed to uh, do something about my RSI complaints. I'll skip this one because of the time. Uh, but, but it's a nice XKCD comic on uh, Dvorak. Um, so you should check it out later. Uh, this is the Dvorak Simplified Keyboard and it was patented by Dr. August Dvorak in 1936. And it looks like this. Has anyone ever seen this one? Yeah, so the, the thing that, um, the thing that uh, uh, immediately comes to my attention is that all the vowels are right here. Well, except for the Y, but all the vowels are at the left of the middle row. Because in the, the, the middle row is the one where our fingers rest. And um, the most uh, common consonants are at the right part of the middle row. So all the most common letters are the middle row, so you don't need your, to move your fingers for, in order to do that. And this was actually uh, his intention. He wanted to reduce your finger motion so that people wouldn't have, uh, so, well, in fact, it, so that typing errors will be reduced. Um, but in th this modern age, uh, when we have so some people have RSI complaints, it can be also used to uh, reduce that. And he claimed to increase typing speed for every user. This is a claim. This has not been prov proven. Um, also, it's well supported on all main operating system, so that's great. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, in the uh, standard average English text, um, this is where all the, the letters would be. So 
In QWERTY, 52% of the characters that you use will be in the top row, 32% in the home, 16% in the bottom. And with Dvorak, this is radically different. 70% in the home row, 22 in the top, and only 8% in the bottom row. And Mr. Dvorak actually uh, believed that the bottom row was pure evil, that it would just, um, it was very bad for your fingers, you know. You were bound to have some pain um, if you would use it uh, for a long period of time. This was his belief, actually. Uh, this is a small heat map, which um, shows a bit more uh, about these, uh, of or is actually a graphical representation of the table that I just showed you, uh, where the most common letters are. So they are really centered around this middle row in the Dvorak layout. And in QWERTY, they are more centered in the top row, which is harder to, uh, to reach. So what if you are just as nuts as I was? <laughs> and you would choose to master a new layout. Uh, I chose Tvorak because it's uh, quite different. You can also use Colmac, which is a bit less invasive. So a lot, lot of QWERTY letters, keys are still in the same place in Colmac. But I chose Tvorak because it was radically different and I like radical things. Uh, you should start by memorizing the different locations and then just practice until you can touch type them. So you know them all by heart. I use this website a lot. Uh, it's just an online course that you can use that starts off with just the home row and then adds more letters until you can type all uh, the Dvorak um, letters. It also provides uh, on this web application a mapping so that you don't even have to configure a different uh, keyboard layout in your OS if you don't want to. And then just uh, practice it a lot more so to increase your typing speed. So what I did, I used to uh, work uh, at work on a QWERTY keyboard and then when I got home and I needed to do some private stuff or some banking or just uh, writing some things, I would uh, uh, practice my Dvorak skills. And uh, when the time came that I could do like 30, 35 words per minute on Dvorak, I switched this. So I typed Dvorak at work and I typed QWERTY at home because a lot of people who switch uh, from QWERTY to Dvorak and never look back, they will unlearn QWERTY quite fast. And if there's no QWERTY layout available, this will be a problem. For example, at my uh, past project, we had a, a Citrix uh, virtual uh, workplace, which I used to get to another computer. And uh, I had to type my password in QWERTY always, and I couldn't change it because I had no administrating uh, rights on this virtual workplace. So I needed to be able to type QWERTY still. Um, some challenges, some people craft the Dvorak keyboard, they put stickers on their keyboard so they can see all the letters, uh, Dvorak and blue and QWERTY and white. I haven't done this, I just memorized it and it's better anyway, because who wants to look at their keys? Uh, punctuation is a challenge, where are, where are all these, uh, all these different, uh, you, you know, uh, colons and, uh, and, pu and punctuation marks? Um, some emoticons might be a challenge. Also bash commands, ls, is done with the same finger in Dvorak which is quite a challenge, I guess. Um, typing the word QWERTY becomes a pain. I had to type the word QWERTY quite a lot for this presentation, you know. <laughs> you don't want to type that word on, word on a Dvorak keyboard. And lastly, this awkward 30-second explanation if a coworker needs your computer. What, uh, what, what is this? What is this thing doing? What, what is this? It's quite awkward. But, you know, my colleagues know me now, and they think, oh, him again with his weird... Uh, uh, weird keyboard layout. So one final image I want to show you. This is my progress um, of learning Dvorak. So I started in um, April 2017, and this was my QWERTY speed, the blue bars. This is characters per minute. So this translates to roughly 80 words per minute in an average text. And I keep practicing my QWERTY each week. I did the typing test each week, and it was quite stable. Here I had to do a lot of... Uh, QWERTY work at home in, at evening, so I was getting better at it. And well, actually, it's quite stable. And Dvorak started on 150 char characters per uh, per minute. And I practiced it for 12 months, and it's not a steep climb, a slow learning curve actually. But but right now I'm at at, at 350, so I'm not even as fast as on QWERTY uh, as I was a year ago. So. Don't switch if you want speed, because you won't get it, and it will take a long time if you to get to the same speed. Um, let's summarize for a bit. Now, on the QWERTY language, this was never intended to slow down typists, and not, there's not really much evidence for solving the jamming problem. I think the layout was probably optimized for telegraph users. Um, nevertheless, a very old-fashioned layout. And now, the Dvorak layout is less tiring to use than QWERTY and reduces, or as I, in my case, uh, that is. 
and I hope it will, will for your case also, but mastering it will take a lot of time, and you can't even be sure that you will type faster on the Dvorak layout, and not very soon also. So should I switch? Well, only if your fingers are killing you from time to time, from uh, programming uh, at work, uh, or if you have a year to spare to crank up your Dvorak typing speed uh, like I did. And if it just feels wrong to use a layout that was optimized for either a profession or a mechanical problem that doesn't even exist anymore, if you think I can't live with that, then by all means switch to a different layout. Um, so thank you all for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions, come see me afterwards. If you want to see the slides, they're on my GitHub page. And um, thanks a lot for sticking with me. Thank you.